chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about deceitful deals and squiggly surprises. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. As a reminder, the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast is now airing two times a week for twice the terror, with me hosting on Wednesdays. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Brett O'Reilly and Marcus Demanda are voice talents Paul J. McSorley and Danielle Hewitt. Now... Get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Brett O'Reilly and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. In it, we meet a man desperate to be back with the love of his life. Only problem is, they're on different planes. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Between the Lines. Anthony Cooper hunched his shoulders and hugged himself in a valiant but vain attempt to fend off the cold. A shiver ran through his thin, frail frame as he paused for a moment to watch the activity on the ice. Children, garbed in protective gear, skated like clumsy penguins. Many gladiators engaged in the sport of peewee hockey. Anthony observed with little interest. Having no children of his own, he found their antics neither amusing nor endearing. They simply were. A set of stairs draped in moss green carpet rose behind the bleachers. Readjusting the book under his arm, he climbed them. Slowly. He rested at the top, leaning on the low wall that separated the landing from the uppermost row of bleachers. A short hallway extended before him, continuing the mossy green pathway. Both walls were covered in wood paneling, a pockmarked reminder of a forgotten decade. He eyed the door at the end, not a heavy door made of solid oak or teak. Nah, this door was cheap, flimsy balsa wood, cheap as the wood paneling on the walls. Hardly the door to the dragon's lair. A young couple brushed past him, chatting amicably with each other. They passed through the door without hesitation, leaving it open a sliver. Anthony stood for a moment, catching a whisper of the young lady's perfume in the still air of the corridor. Sandalwood and roses. Like Nora. Pushing off the wall, Anthony worked his way down the hall and through the door, leaving the squeal of childhood hockey behind. He took a seat in the back row of three. All the chairs were the same generic chrome and vinyl fixtures that populated a thousand waiting rooms in a thousand doctor's offices and clinics. Alone in the row, he surveyed the room. The carpet on the other side of the door was gray instead of green, though possibly of the same generation. The wood paneling was clearly a recurring theme. 
Similar chairs lined one wall, though these were stacked five or six high, with a few of the stacks on chair dollies. The wall opposite was bare, save for a large window which Anthony guessed overlooked the ice rink. A tattered set of once white Venetian blinds blocked out all but a strip of light at the bottom. In the middle of the second row of chairs, directly in front of him, sat the lovers that had passed him in the hall, quietly holding hands. In the first row, a woman sat with her preteen daughter at the far end by the stacked chairs, a small jewelry box in her lap. The woman had a defeated look about her, and Anthony felt a small surge of pity before allowing his gaze to travel on. At the end, closer to the window, a miserable-looking middle-aged couple snapped at each other in low voices. Anthony shifted his attention to the two men sitting at card tables in the middle of the room. Both were dressed in wool slacks and cheap polyester dress shirts open at the collar. The older one had wire-rimmed reading glasses perched on the end of his nose. The younger, a jeweler's loop inserted into his eye. The pair made Anthony think of car salesmen, albeit without the smarminess or arrogance he associated with that trade. Instead, these two had a cold authenticity about them, the kind one might imagine to be found in professional hitmen. Smith and Jones, Anthony thought. I dub thee Smith and Jones. Soft amusement flickered across his face. Smith, the older one, was making notations in a ledger, the chairs in front of him empty. His younger partner, Jones, now sands the loop, Anthony noticed, placed a gold necklace on a small jeweler's scale. The elderly woman sitting before him watched with a hawkish eye. Jones made a note on a scrap of paper before trading the necklace for a wedding band. Another notation followed. Jones's left hand moved to a printing calculator where his fingers flew across the keys. The receipt paper roll chirped and whirred with the imprint of digits. When it had spit out the last few lines of numbers, Jones ripped the sheet from the calculator and circled the bottom figure. He pushed the sheet over to the woman and sat with his hands folded on the table in front of him. His face was a mask of dull resolve. Anthony intuitively understood that whatever the woman had been offered, it was final. It took her a good ten seconds to come to the same conclusion. Anthony watched her bout of sputtering and her rumfing with mild interest. He wondered if she would break. And then she did. With slumped shoulders, she accepted the not ungenerous stack of bills that Jones counted out to her from a steel cash box that sat beside the calculator. Next, Smith called out in a bass voice. The squabbling couple took seats in front of him as Jones's client stood up to leave. The old woman paused and scowled at the room as if she dared anyone to mock her for her moment of weakness. She left, hurriedly. Jones called out next in a baritone similar to Anthony's own. The mother and child stood. Anthony waited and waited. The lovers were just finishing up with Smith when Jones announced Anthony's turn. Anthony rose and made his way with deliberate care towards the empty chair awaiting him. As he hoped for, the young pair departed before he arrived at his seat. He lowered himself gingerly to the hard vinyl cushioning, not coming fully to rest until he heard the door click shut behind them. Jones leaned forward on the card table, hands folded. Oh, may we help you today? Anthony found the we amusing, given that Smith had begun picking up the contents of his workstation. For a brief moment, he thought perhaps he should let Jones do the same. Just a stupid old man, he thought, with a stupid idea in his head. He thought of the mother selling the contents of a jewelry box. What treasures had she given to see her daughter fed or clothed? What sentimental heirlooms had she surrendered for a better life for her child. Lifting the book from his lap, he placed it on the table and pushed it towards Jones. On top of the book sat a flyer with metallic letters on a black background declaring, Cash for Gold. Below a jeweler's scale much like Jones's own was draped with coins and gold chains. Next to it floated a fan of $100 bills. 
At the bottom of the page, the Dark Water Ice Sports Complex name and address was stenciled in the same metallic hue. I'm sorry, sir. We don't buy books. Jones pushed the book back gently. His face softened. Smith gave both Anthony and the book a passing glance and continued packing. The tremor in Anthony's hand as he intercepted the book had little to do with his age. You don't understand. I don't want to sell the book. I want what's in the book. Confused, Jones slid the flyer off the cover. The Secret Garden? Anthony silently cursed his shaking hands as he reached out and flipped open the cover. It was my wife's favorite book, he said, tapping the photograph that lay inside. The bewilderment on Jones's face grew as Smith steadfastly ignored the conversation. They think I'm senile, Anthony thought. Might as well get to the crux of it. My wife, Nora, died five years ago, he said. She had a stroke, a massive one, while driving. She hit a telephone pole. She was killed instantly. I'm... I'm so sorry, Jones started. Anthony cut him off. I want her back. I know you can bring her back for me. He took a deep breath. I'm here to sell my soul. Smith and Jones both froze in place. Anthony shivered. The temperature in the room seemed to have dropped 10 degrees. Jones broke the silence. I'm sorry, sir. We don't... Oh, but you do. I know, said Anthony. Listen, Mr. Cooper, Jones spoke softly. I'm sorry about your wife. I'm... We're... He gestured at Smith who sat with a keen eye trained on Anthony. Sorry for your loss, but we buy gold, silver, some gemstones, occasionally stamps. But souls? You bought Kevin Marlowe's. He told me so himself. He's the one who told me about you. Puzzled, Jones glanced at his partner who nodded. Kevin Marlowe, three years ago. Young guy. Daughter had leukemia. A glint of recognition caught in Jones's eye. Anthony spoke. You remember him. He's my next door neighbor. His daughter, Audrey, was terminal. Then the cancer mysteriously went into remission. Within a year, it was gone. A miracle, they said. Smith grimaced. Not a word we tend to use. I don't care what you call it, Anthony said. I just want my wife back. Smith and Jones looked at Anthony for a long moment, then at each other. The shift was almost imperceptible. Anthony certainly saw no change in appearance, no betrayal of thought in either man's face. Yet, he knew the exact moment when he had won. Jones turned back to Anthony. While my colleague does up the paperwork... We need to be very clear on a few things. After all, we're not talking about Aunt Millicent's prize gold necklace here. We're talking about your soul. I am aware of what I'm offering. And we do need to be clear. No monkey's paw. Jones blinked. I'm sorry? Smith leaned over from the other table which now hosted an old electric typewriter. The Chandler Incident, back in 1901. The Chandler Incident, Jones went from perplexed to shock. Oh, oh, oh no, Mr. Cooper. I assure you, we do not. We would never. He paused for the right words. We are not common thugs, Mr. Cooper. We are not charlatans or snake oil salesmen. We are businessmen, and we do have ethics. Anthony studied Jones's face. Satisfied with what he saw, he nodded. Jones exhaled. 
the electric typewriter began to chatter under Smith's attention. Okay, now, first of all, should you choose to proceed with this agreement, you are aware that at the conclusion of this agreement, you will be relinquishing your immortal soul to us for eternity. No refund, no exchange, no exemption, no circumvention. Your immortal soul. I need that to be crystal clear, Mr. Cooper, before we proceed any further. Jones waited. The staccato of the typewriter paused. Anthony met Jones's gaze and nodded. The typewriter resumed its whirs and clicks. All right, Jones continued. Next, you want your wife, Nora Cooper, back from death. I assure you, she is not going to return to you fresh from the grave. She will be returned to you alive, as she was shortly before her actual demise. Not after. That we guarantee. Anthony nodded. Now, you are how old? Seventy-four, Anthony answered. Hmm. Jones's right hand found a pencil and began to twirl it. And Nora was how old when she died? Seventy-one. I see. Jones tapped the pencil on the table. Mr. Cooper, most people who come to us for this type of transaction are usually looking at a lengthy time span. Thirty, forty, even fifty years. As the two of you are already at an advanced age, the most we can offer you is ten years if I may be frank with you, Mr. Cooper, that's not a lot of time for something as weighty as your soul. Anthony leaned forward and rested his arms on the table, his palms flat on the book. Nora, sad-eyed and frozen in sepia, peered up from between his hands. I appreciate your concern, Mr. J... Anthony caught himself before using the full moniker he had assigned the younger man. I appreciate your concern. However, I assure you that I am in full possession of my mental faculties. I've thought this through. Anthony's eyes focused on a spot above Jones's right shoulder. I met her in college, you know. I know it sounds so cliché. She sat two rows down in my thematic approach to Western literature class. Sex and Death 102, we used to call it. It was love at first sight for me. Anthony smiled. She took a bit of persuading. We were married within a year and I never looked back. Forty-nine years together. Forty-nine wonderful years. The week before our 50th anniversary, she was gone. Silence hung heavily in the air. The typewriter stilled to make space for Anthony's story. Smith and Jones both waited patiently as Anthony recollected his thoughts. So, you see, Anthony resettled his gaze on Jones. To you, ten years may seem a passing shadow, here and gone. To me, it is a lifetime. A lifetime with my Nora. Jones nodded thoughtfully. All right, Mr. Cooper. All right, and for the record, you can use Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. That's fine. Anthony nodded in return, grateful for Jones's acquiescence. He consciously chose not to question how Jones knew about his nicknames for the two of them. Smith pulled a sheet from the electric typewriter with practiced efficiency and added it to a stack. He smoothed the edges of the stack, affixed a binder clip, and handed the bundle to Jones who in turn laid it before Anthony. This is our standard Faustian contract, for ease of terminology. It covers the return of your wife, Nora Cooper, to you as she was before her death. It also guarantees, and this is very important, Mr. Cooper, we guarantee that neither of you shall perish during the term of the contract, that term being 
10 calendar years beginning at... Jones checked his watch. 6 p.m. today. That does not mean either of you are invulnerable, Mr. Cooper. If you jump off an overpass into oncoming traffic, yes, you will live. The damages, however, will likely be of a nature that you'll be sorry you did. Are we clear on that? Anthony nodded. Yes. Good. As I was saying, you will have ten full calendar years with your wife to spend as you see fit. Upon conclusion of our agreement, she will be released from the protection this contract affords her. At that time, we relinquish and are absolved of all responsibility and accountability for her state of being. She will not be returned to a state of death. Whatever happens to her from that point forward is in accordance with the will of man and nature. Thank you. Tears of gratitude welled in Anthony's eyes. Jones leaned over. Please keep in mind, Mr. Cooper. You also will have no responsibility or accountability for her as of that final date. As per the agreement, at 6 p.m. on said date, you will surrender your soul to one of our agents. To any and all observers, you will appear to have died of heart failure, an appropriate cause of death for a man of your advanced years. Do you understand? Anthony nodded again. Yes. Excellent. In that case, Jones flipped open the document and began lightly circling with his pencil. I'll need you to read through carefully, then sign everywhere circle. I'm sorry that we can't allow you to take this to a lawyer first. However, given the nature of the transaction, you understand. He handed Anthony a Bic ballpoint pen. What? No signature in blood? Anthony half-joked. That's at the end, Jones replied. And just a thumbprint is required. Anthony poured over the contents of the agreement with the hawkishness of a contract lawyer. Everything appeared exactly as Jones had described, except she'll... she'll be waiting for me? At home? Yes, Mr. Cooper. Smith rejoined the conversation. The shock of being returned can be quite difficult to process. Waking up in her own bed, in familiar surroundings will help ease her transition to the living. Likewise, doing so alone will allow her time to adjust before she engages with another person, even if that person is her devoted husband. Anthony nodded and signed his name in the first penciled oval. As some people say, the devil's in the details, he remarked. Some people say that, Jones agreed. As Anthony signed off on the rest of the document, Jones produced a black pen-like cylinder with the words AccuCheck Soft Clicks stenciled on the side. To make this agreement binding, I do need your thumbprint in your own blood on the final page next to your signature. Jones pushed down on one end of the lancing device. True to its name, a soft click sounded. Smith spoke up. One last note, Mr. Cooper, before you proceed. When we're finished here, we will never see each other again. We do not have a complaints department, and our head office, such as it is, is not reachable by more... Smith corrected himself. By clients. As for Mr. Jones and I, we will become completely untraceable to you. Upon completion of the terms of this agreement... It will be a member of the collections department that visits you, not us. Mr. Jones and I are sales. We don't do field work. Anthony looked for a long moment at the two men across the card tables, dressed in their wool slacks and polyester dress shirts. He then held out his hand, fist clenched, thumb extended. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I understand. Anthony paused and leaned his forehead against the front door. 
steeled himself. He needed to be strong. Strong for Nora. He opened the door and stepped inside, focused on the tasks at hand. Shoes off, into the closet, neatly placed next to two other pairs. Overcoat onto a hanger, also into the closet. The book, with Nora's photo still tucked into it, he set on the small table in the front entry. The cash for gold flyer had disappeared somewhere between the brink and his car. He wasn't concerned. He didn't need it anymore. He took a step into the hall. On his left, the living room. To his right, the spare bedroom. At the end of the hall was the kitchen. An adjoining hall led right, passing the main bathroom and a linen closet on the way to the master bedroom. The faint scent of perfume hung in the air. Sandalwood and roses. Sandalwood and roses. Anthony began to tremble. He began to shake so badly he wasn't sure he could walk. He took a step. Another. And another. By the time he reached the open door to the master bedroom, he was almost running. At the door, he paused, uncomprehending. The bedroom was empty of life, yet in complete disarray. Autumn twilight trickled through the open curtains to fall on unruly bed covers. An open suitcase sprawled on the bed, its cavity a third full of clothes pulled from open dresser drawers. Nora's drawers, which he had never had the heart to clear out. The closet door stood ajar, a few empty hangers on her side on display. A growing sense of panic elevated the pitch of Anthony's voice, even as his hand closed into a fist at the disordered state of the room. Nora? Anthony checked the unsweet bathroom, then the main. Both empty. His heart jackhammered in his chest. The scent of her perfume was everywhere, as if it were placed to both entice and terrify him. He entered the kitchen and cast about for signs of life. Nora? The kitchen held only silence. He turned to investigate the living room and noticed the back door was slightly ajar. The garden. Her garden. Roses and lilies in honor of the two sisters in her favorite book. Nora's very own secret garden. Her place of refuge when the world became overwhelming. Anthony opened the door with trembling hands and stepped onto the small back porch. Dusk had set in and the garden was draped in long shadows. He searched the gloom for signs of life. His frustration grew as he scanned the flower beds and statuary, fists clenched at his side. Did they lie to me? Was it all a sham? An elaborate prank played on a stupid old man? Something stirred by the rose trellis as the scent of sandalwood and roses blossomed in the air. Anthony stepped off the porch and entered the garden. A silhouette by the trellis took shape as he approached, at first a vaguely person-sized shade. The nearer he drew, the more the shade's features became defined. A silver-haired woman, dressed in jeans and a white rumpled blouse, cowered in the evening's silence. Nora? The woman tensed, looked up at him. Their eyes met, his shining with recognition, hers clouded by it. The right one, Anthony saw, was puffy, only just beginning to swell. I forgot. That night. Anthony Cooper looked upon the bruised face of his once dead wife, Nora. At his side, his hand began to ache with memory. Nora? His voice was little more than a squeak. And then... The left side of Nora's face sagged, causing the last part of his name to come out as a sinking E. Her eyes rolled up in her head, her left leg crumpled beneath her. Nora! Anthony screamed. For the love of God, Tony, be straight with me. Who is she? I told you, Tom... It's Nora. It's my wife. The doctor in the rumpled shirt and coat exhaled in frustration. Tony, Nora's been dead for five years. I know. I signed her death certificate. I appreciate this. Tom glanced through the door at the figure in the hospital bed. 
woman happens to look uncannily like Nora, but it's not. Nora's dead. So who is she? It's Nora, Tom, came the reply. Believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Do one of your DNA tests if you have to. All that matters is I have my Nora back. Tony, it's not Nora. And even if it was, is this having her back? The poor woman had a massive stroke. Dr. Harding says the damage is among the worst he's ever seen. And I'm not about to question Darkwater Memorial's only neurologist. She's never going to walk or talk again, let alone feed herself. Anthony looked at his longtime friend and physician. Tom, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you believe me or not. And it doesn't matter. His voice wavered. If she needs someone to spoon feed her for the next ten years, it's not like I have more pressing things to do. Tom sighed. I know you miss her, Tony. I miss my Annika every day. But we have to move on. You have to move on. You can't adopt strange women that happen to look like your late wife. There's probably a family out there looking for her right now. Tom's voice lowered. And even if, by some crazy miracle, it is her. Remember the night she died, Tony? The suitcases in the trunk? Nora wasn't coming back then. She's definitely not coming back now. I don't know who that is, Tony. But it definitely is not Nora. Anthony turned away and looked at the woman in the room. Thank you for coming down, Tom. If you don't mind, I'm going to go read to my wife. He stepped across the threshold into the room and pulled a chair from the far corner closer to the bed. Behind him, Tom muttered, And I'm going to see about that DNA test. He watched for a moment as Anthony pulled out a book, then headed to the nurse's station. Anthony cracked open the cover of the secret garden and moved Nora's photograph towards the back. When I say all sales are final, I do mean final. Satisfaction or not? He looked at his beloved Nora, still in the hospital bed. An IV ran from one arm to a bag of clear liquid hanging from a chrome tower, a small machine attached to the tower displaying meaningless digits. The smell of her perfume was gone, replaced by the odd antiseptic odor possessed by a thousand hospitals. She will be returned to you fully alive, as she was, shortly before her demise. Anthony studied her left eye, which seemed to drift in its socket, isolated and unaware. Her right eye, now surrounded by deep purple, was fixed on a spot on the ceiling. Just a random spot of no interest. He wondered if it saw anything at all. She had a stroke. A massive one, while driving. She hit a telephone pole. She was killed instantly. Only this time, she wasn't driving. There was no telephone pole. This time, she had her devoted husband on hand to call 911. No one had asked about her black eye. Some people say the devil's in the details. Only... Sometimes he's not, Anthony said aloud. Sometimes he's between the lines. Anthony turned his attention to the book. Chapter 1, he read, Oblivious to the desperate tears that rolled down his wife's right cheek. I hope you enjoyed Between the Lines, as written by Brett O'Reilly and performed by Paul J. McSorley. Actor Paul J. McSorley can be found right here on our very own network, as well as over on Audible at paulsbooks.net. And be sure to check out Fear from the Heartland, which has over 120 episodes for you to love and enjoy.
Our second tiny but terrifying tale of the evening is written by Marcus Demanda and is performed by Danielle Hewitt. There's nothing like a good cup of coffee, am I right? Well, we'll see what you think after listening to this. Now, without further ado, I present to you Sprinkles. I'm more than a little OCD. Until this morning, I never saw this as a problem. I just have to prepare, take care of things, same as anyone else. Example, I have to have at least two of everything I might run out of. That way I know I'll never run out. I have two cans of shaving cream in the bathroom, two tubes of toothpaste, a spare toothbrush, and a spare shaving razor. If I should run one of my cans of shaving cream dry tomorrow morning, I'll know I have to go to the store. Here's another. I like my food in solid, uninterrupted colors. If I splatter ketchup or mustard on anything, I have to clean that shit up with a napkin, shake up the bottle, and try again. Generally, I have condiments on the side to avoid this calamity. As you can imagine, things like black-eyed peas would be impossible for me. And if I'm to have sprinkles on my ice cream, they have to be the same color as the ice cream itself. That goes for my caramel macchiato with sprinkles on top, too. But here, I'm a little adventurous. Or I was this morning. Just the idea of putting those little sugar sprinkles on top is kind of risky, since the drink changes from creamy white to dark honey brown just under the surface. And that's one very good reason these things are served in paper cups and not glass or plastic. You don't have to see the colors mixing together. You just work your way down from one to the next without looking too much or overthinking it. So, I took a chance when the barista offered me sprinkles. Something I'd never even considered putting on my favorite hot drink before. YOLO, I thought to myself. Let's do this. But I have to have white sprinkles, of course. Because the top of a caramel macchiato is white. Problem was... As my barista explained, she only had sprinkle shakers in multiple colors. I told her I'd pass on the sprinkles then. No big deal. Thanks for the suggestion. She gave me that long-suffering look that non-OCD people reserve for people like me. She explained that there was virtually no difference between colored sprinkles and white ones. They're exactly the same. I was tempted to leave. I wanted to explain why I could only have white sprinkles, just so she'd understand. Leave me alone about it. I didn't need any sprinkles at all, really. I liked my caramel macchiato just fine without them. Instead, I clammed up, and that made an awkward silence. And that made me panicky. So I said the only thing I could get out just then. Just white sprinkles, please. She sighed with anger, swept up the multicolored sprinkler shaker in one hand, and left with it behind the door that led to the back, abandoning her co-worker to deal with the whole line of customers behind me by himself. I felt legit bad. I wanted to leave now more than ever. And the guy server told me I shouldn't have done that. He said that Courtney was super stubborn. I shrugged. I didn't even know her name was Courtney. But I couldn't leave. This was my coffee place. Right here. Nowhere else. If I left like this, I could never come back to it. So I stayed. And eventually, Courtney re-emerged with the sprinkler shaker in one hand within which I could not see a single white sprinkle, and a coffee filter in the other. She shook the filter under my nose. In it, I saw a small mound of only white sprinkles. 
She asked if I was happy now. I told her that I was. I got my caramel macchiato with white sprinkles, and I quite enjoyed it. For all of the walk home. I knew better than to look inside of it once I got a few sips in. And honestly, it didn't taste noticeably different with the new addition of sprinkles. It was a sweet drink to begin with. So in the end, I had nothing to complain about. But some of those sprinkles lingered in the bottom of the cup when I tossed it in the trash. That bugged me. It bugged me a lot. I'd just have to take the whole bag down to the trash, even though the bag was only half full. I let it go, though, because my stomach felt suddenly funny. In fact, it felt bad, and I was pretty much incapacitated for the rest of the day. Only started to clear up a little while ago. But that's not the worst thing. Usually, I don't see OCD as a problem. But, half an hour ago, the sprinkles at the bottom of my coffee cup hatched. And now, something on the inside of my stomach tickles. I hope you enjoyed Sprinkles, as written by Marcus Demanda and performed by Danielle Hewitt. You can hear more of Danielle Hewitt over on the Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. That's C R E E P Y P O D.com. These two tales tonight were brought to us courtesy of Velox Books. You can check out more from these authors and more by visiting their website, www.veloxbooks.com. That's V-E-L-O-X-B-O-O-K-S.com. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. (laughs) Ha 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 ha.